Please hold the line. We will answer your call as soon as possible. Today my guest on Please Hold is Rob Wiesenthal. Rob is the co-founder and CEO of Blade. Blade is the Uber for helicopters. And that just sounds like an awesome concept. I can't wait to talk to you about it. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So my first question is really about the music business because you have a very unusual background. Yeah. Um, you started in 2000, the music business was at its peak in 2000, and you eventually became the CFO of Sony Music and the CEO of Warner. And then you left to start the Uber for helicopters. Um, what made you leave and uh, how do you see the music business today? How healthy is it as an industry? Uh, well, I was actually at Sony, I was CFO of Sony Corporation of America, which included music, movies, and television, so I had a, a pretty broad background in content in general. and then. After that, uh, I left to become CEO of Warner Music. Um, Blade is a lot, you know, I would say, the Uber analogy is an easy one, but the kind of way we look at it is it's, it's basically a highly branded short distance aviation company that gets as close to on demand in aviation as you can, short distance being under 400 miles. But you want to talk a little bit about the music business? I'll, give you a couple minutes. Yeah, no, well, Dr. Blade, I'm curious, fine. how do you see it today? Is it is it in a healthy state? Have they recalibrated yeah, and now they're I getting their we're footing? Finally, you know, we're finally at the inflection point where, um, you know, the, the digital pennies have exceeded the physical dollars, obviously. I think people are in, interested in access and not ownership. So we've seen the transition from, you know, CDs to downloads, and now downloads to streaming and streaming for free to subscription models that are actually working. Um, so this idea that I can, I can have my music just in the cloud and pay for access instead of ownership is uh, working. The data is terrific. The numbers are really starting to uh, bear fruit for those artists that uh, know how to use the technology right and also allow their content to be ubiquitous. But still, live is the biggest part of the business and will be for some time. But we're definitely at an inflection point in terms of monetization of masters and publishing in terms of uh, music publishing rights, which are essentially the lyrics and the melodies of songs, you know, that is now is growing at a steady rate and is less susceptible to piracy, to, you know, other means of non-monetization, for lack of a better term, because it's used in commercials and movies and things like that. And the value of music is just going up. So you're a bull, like you would invest in a record label. You feel like record labels are going to be around in 20 years in the same form? Yeah, look, I think it obviously we always said like it's going to get much smaller which it has, and now it's gonna to start to grow. And we're now at that point where, you know, there's still gonna be some more contraction, but you know, you see the light at the end of the tunnel and you know, you're not gonna remember when these were companies that were making, you know, a billion dollars of cash for each. It's gonna, it's just, just a smaller industry. Yep. But uh, they, they are now, from the point that they are right now, definitely growing. So um, I used to do a lot in the music business with my last startup, Mobile Roadie, which was making mobile apps for bands and musicians. We did a lot with labels. And someone once told me, once you're in the music business for a decade, you're kind of in for life and just going to bounce around. What made you leave? Uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, it's like what, a lot of people say, what does it feel like to leave the entertainment business? Because I'm actually, let's say, I'm third generation entertainment. My son is fourth generation. And so my family's always been in media and entertainment. Uh, I don't feel like I've left the entertainment business one bit. Um, you know, if you think about film, television, music, it's about creating an emotional connection, you know, with a listener or a viewer, and for me, it's a flyer. Um, someone who, you know, really hasn't enjoyed aviation the way it was back, say, in the Kennedy era, when it was an adventure and there was excitement, it really turned into transportation. So I had a view as to how do you bring that back, this amazing experience on the ground, great experience in the air, make it exciting again, leverage technology. Um, and uh, it'd be much e I felt it'd be much easier to do it in short distance aviation where there's a lot of fragmentation than say, go try to buy United Airlines and turn it around to something else. So at first it was kind of an experiment a little bit. I incubated the company. I wasn't at the company for two years, but now I think it's probably in the in markets that it operates probably has the highest recognition of any uh, uh, any type of air provider outside the large commercial airlines. You had a pretty cushy job at Warner. You you were sort of at the top of where you could get in the music business. So what was that sort of spark? Or were you tired of the music business, or you were just so excited about this opportunity that you left? I you know I've been 
working, I started my career when I was 19 at First Boston and then was there for from 86 to 99, 2000, 2012 at Sony, I think 2012, 2013, 2015 at Warner's. And I think you get to a stage where, you know, you want your own, to create your own mosaic. You want to create, a, you know, a product, a service, a business that you have a very distinct view of, which has a singular mission, and you kind of live by the sword, die by the sword. You know, I spent a lot of time in really big companies. It's tough to get things done in big companies. And... Uh, a lot of easy, you know, a lot of easy ways to blame bureaucracy. If this doesn't work, I got no one to blame but myself. But so far, so good. Yeah. So at Service, we handle people's customer service issues. Um, we've saved people over two hundred seventy-five thousand minutes by handling the customer service issues for them. Um, do you measure your business like that? I mean, how much time have you saved people that haven't had to sit in traffic because they're just floating over it in a helicopter? Well, you know, I'll, I, I'll give you some. You know, statistics. I mean, the biggest, I'd say, you know, a big part of Blade is reducing friction. There's no question. And, you know, in New York City, I think the number may be 40,000 Ubers on the street now. That obviously, as ride sharing and Uber pool gets bigger and things like that, that should hopefully go down. But, you know, congestion's not getting any better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, through our analysis, it's uh, the average person feels comfortable from the west side of Manhattan leaving for about three hours to get to Kennedy Airport. Uh, our, and in, because there's so much dynamic range between not having traffic, not having accidents, not having road closures during the construction, you know, you could do it in 45 minutes, you could do it in three hours, you don't know. And that's the unknown is what we definitely feed upon because, you know, it, you're, if you miss your flight, a lot of times people are there's in one and a half an hour later, so the architecture of your trip changes. Uh, we can get you from the west side of Manhattan to Kennedy in five minutes. Um, so we now have people who, I don't wanna say they've gamed the system, but they've gotten so perfect at it that we have people that will leave Manhattan at four o'clock for a 4.40 flight wow. and have time for coffee. Uh, so, is, you know, they're, they're, are the they're skies ever congested? Is there ever an equivalent? Of no, 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 not not even close. I mean, I think that you know there are areas around Manhattan, especially on the southern tip of Manhattan, which we don't always fly to, where there's a fair amount of uh, helicopter tourism traffic. But you know, with air traffic control, there's there's uh, Hudson River that you speak to. There are operators there. You speak to other pilots. Uh, it's uh, there's busyness, but I, I wouldn't call it congestion. You know, sometimes there's limited airspace uh, due to TFRs, or so temporary flight restrictions. We have a new president-elect who's spending a lot of time at hand. That's changing things a little bit. Uh, but I don't really see with short distance aviation, specifically helicopters, which are obviously uh, easily maneuverable in three dimensions, um, any kind of issue with congestion at this point. It's incredible. Yeah. Five minutes to JFK. Yeah. Um, so the Hamptons recently relaxed regulations around flights that I think you got really paved the way for you guys to flourish there. Um, I'm curious how you see the regulatory environment um, around Blade. Is it like a Uber style battle in each place you operate in or is it much easier? Uh, I, I think it's very, very difficult. I mean, I think, you know, outside safety are number one priority is being a good neighbor um, because for a variety of reasons, helicopter travel in certain areas is a polarizing type view. Um, and it has to do with everything from people who you know, say that, you know, I'm not doing that kind of travel, it's irrelevant to me, but they're flying over my airspace or flying over my home and I hear it. To people who are right near airports, who made a decision perhaps to live near an airport and probably didn't suspect that the increase in traffic would happen. Um, you know, it's not for me to say whether these, whether these people are wrong or right. They have their views and we have to listen to them and they're being very, very vocal. I mean, mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to have good energy around your company. So we work with local municipalities to think about altitudes, low, uh, uh, low noise helicopters, quiet helicopters as they call them, below 90 decibels altitudes, new routes, you know, how can we minimize the impact on people, uh, specifically with noise. And the technology is changing all the time, making it easier and better. And because we're asset light and we don't own anything, 
We, we simply have deals with operators. We can optimize our fleet for certain locations based, you know, speed, noise, configurations, all these things. But it's, you know, I think it's a real issue. Um, Again, I guess you can't do what Uber did, which is ask for forgiveness. You actually do need to ask for permission. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you could ask for forgiveness, but it's a very expensive <laughs> it's expensive forgiveness. policy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, so, we, you know, our view is with the Department of Transportation who, who manages, you know, oversees our business. Um, you know, we really go for the path of least resistance and said, you know, like, how can we make this work? And we'll yeah. work around that to make it work for them and for us. You know, you can go brute force and say, you know what? This is what it is, and I'm going to keep doing it, and you're going to have to change the law, and I'll, you know, I got lawyers, and we're not, we, A, we don't have the financial wherewithal on that, and B, I'm not sure, it hasn't, that doesn't feel like the way we best operate. And we've always found ways to work with um, DOT, local airports, but, you know, sometimes it's tough. I mean, it's not easy. So I, I empathize with the people who hit walls. We hit walls sometimes, too. I'm curious where you think the aviation industry is headed as a whole. Um, you know, there's Surf Air, there's member jets, there's a lot of them. Um, do you foresee private sort of on-demand aviation is becoming more of the norm, or is it always going to be a, pr a wealthy privilege to be able to take a helicopter to JFK in five minutes? Well, I think, look, I think we've reduced, we've done a great job reducing the cost of short distance aviation. Um, when I, uh, before we started Blade, it would pretty much be $6,000 to fly a helicopter to the Hamptons, maybe 4000 on a very, you know, a single engine helicopter or something. We've gotten that price down originally to $545, $595 now probably. Uh, airports were probably a $3,000 proposition, maybe $2,000. Uh, we'll now do buy the seat for $295 or your own six person helicopter from 895 if you divide that by the seat you're coming close to uber black territory so yeah. i think that we've definitely made it more accessible to a whole swath of people who would otherwise not do it for some people it's a luxury for some people it's a necessity um but i think that you know we're going to keep driving down, but at a certain point, it's, technology is going to have to take over in terms of aviation where we can get what we call the DOCs, the direct operating costs, down to make it even more uh, available to a larger uh, you know, uh, cast of uh, you know, citizens in the areas we operate. Yep. Um, we're in Vegas right now. Is there going to be a time when I can take a helicopter from LA to Vegas or from LA to Palm Springs, or are those distances just not make sense? No, LA Palm Springs makes perfect sense. We partnered with Uber for Coachella. Uh, we powered Uber Chopper. It was available. It was actually the first time Uber allowed someone to put an Uber product on another app, so you could buy Uber Chopper on the on the Uber app or Blade. Uh, that's a perfect run. Uh, LA Vegas is. Um, Probably not a great run, both in terms of cost uh, and time. Once you get above 100 miles, helicopters become less interesting economically. Okay. And if you have a runway on both sides and it's over 100 miles, you're probably better off dealing with what we call fixed wing planes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have to land on the pad, then sometimes your, your only choice is a helicopter. Um, so what does expansion look like? You're, you're based in New York. Um, you're in Nantucket, Bahamas, Miami area. Um, wh where do you go from here? Well, I think that, you know, we, we started with Boston and Nantucket uh, last year. Uh, it is, was more of a kind of a feeling out the market. Uh, as GE moves from Fairfield to Boston, it's been publicly announced that there are plans to build a heliport in uh, downtown Boston or near downtown Boston. I think New York, Boston by helicopter, I think that could be potentially a 55 minute proposition from Midtown to Boston. And that to me is a game changer. Um, compared How many to, miles is that? Uh, over 200. Okay. Uh, but I think that uh, the right speed helicopter, you're now saving just so much time, you know, the kind of hour and a half to the airport and then maybe 30 minutes waiting there and the hour, which is half an hour on the tarmac, half an hour in the air. Or the train, which isn't really high speed. Yeah, and then 20 minutes, you know, through the airport, then another 20 minutes near cap to Boston. I mean, I, I really think we're turning at that point, we're turning four hours to 55 minutes. And yeah. I think that's, uh, that's something on our radar as well as uh, in Los Angeles, you know, Palm Springs, Santa, Mo uh, Santa Monica, Palm Springs, uh, San Diego, Santa Barbara. These are routes that we're looking at, you know, 
carefully, cautiously, but right now there's so much opportunity in the Northeast. We want to try to nail that down. Yep. Um, do you guys deal with the same kind of customer service issues as the airlines? Um, it doesn't sound like there's really delays, but and it doesn't sound like there's lost bags. But we what have are delays. The, we have lost bags. Okay. We have so weather. We what are the have, what are the customer service issues? Is it um, similar to an airline? Yeah, I would say it's actually different in the sense that, rightfully so, our flyers, as we refer to them, have a sense of entitlement. They've spent a lot of money. A lot of money. So their expectation is here. Yes. So when you have things like mechanicals or, you know, weather delays, things like that, you know, there are a lot of con difficult conversations. Um, but I think as we train people to realize that, you know, aviation, especially short distance aviation, can be fickle, specifically helicopters, and that we keep your safety paramount, that there are going to be times you're not going to be able to get in a helicopter. That Frankly, that's right. We, why we have a deal with uh, Cadillac that powers our all-weather guarantee. So in the event you have a flight and it's camped for weather, you're going to get in a car free of charge uh, to drive out to a bunch of different locations where we offer the service. Um, so, uh, you know, customer service, you know, we still have a phone icon on our uh, on our app, Uber doesn't, but it's a very, it's a, you know, a product that can go anywhere from $295 to easily $6,000. So, you know, we feel people at this point deserve to talk to someone if they want to. Yep. But we have, you know, in-app messaging, we have, you know, email, we have a million other ways of communicating with them, but there's some people who'd like to pick up the phone. So we are building something that's going to help businesses automate their customer service through a chatbot. And I'm curious if someone's spending 500000 or $6,000, um, is that ever going to be an option? Or is a live person always going to be the answer over a certain dollar amount that someone's spending? Um, I think for certain routes, certain products that aren't so bespoke, I think it's OK. But you know, we have a lot of customers who have special needs, for lack of a better term, special things they want to accomplish. Um, that, so that may be difficult, but I think for, you know, as a first layer to deal with the basic questions, obviously like in any company, you know, there are a hundred questions that are probably represent 80% of the questions we get. Mm -hmm. I'm late. Will it wait? <laughs> Does it wait? Answer is no, if okay. it's by the seat. Um, you know, can I get a refund or do I have to get credits? I mean, there's some basic, you know, because I missed my flight or weather. Um, are you adding another flight at this time? Yeah. So there, there are a lot of basic questions that I think it could be very useful for. Um, and I think as we scale, you know, chatbots are going to be important. I think our demo tends to be a little bit older. Uh, we also, it's in, the, in the kind of the people who use us who are more business oriented, they actually have, you know, assistants do their booking for them as well. Uh, off desktop, you know, we actually start we were mobile first and we then expanded to desktop and desktop is growing incredibly fast because mm. i think a lot of kind of principals and organizations didn't want to hand their phones to their assistants and so that actually has worked out really well for us uh, but uh you know anything to get the you know the cost down in terms of the number of people who have to be live is always something we'd be looking at any anecdotes like what's the craziest customer service issue you've had to deal with so far Gee, craziest customer service issue. Uh, I remember once we had a uh, uh, a half an hour. We had to let we allow pets, and um, we had a kind of almost like a half hour pet therapy session between two dogs who we didn't think would get alone. Did you say Long, pet therapy? I called it pet therapy. There were two dogs that were getting you know how to get to know each other before going aboard because they were actually known to not like each other which we didn't know before that so they spent a half an hour in one of our lounges they got to know each other everybody was happy fiji or some pellegrino well. a little bit of steak exactly no no yeah no no steaks yeah but, uh, i mean <laughs> it, look they're they're I, the stories the stories are are endless but the uh you know people have gotten married on uh proposed on our helicopters, probably more than half a dozen. It's got to be a quick proposal if you only have five minutes. Uh, it's just for the airport. Okay. But sometimes people will book private tours and things and they'll right. propose. And so, yeah, there's some fun stories. I mean, look, it's, you know, people fly blade half for to get from point A to point B and the other half for the uh, experience. Yep. So, uh, 
I think you know now we've expanded into uh, helipad flights. There are doors off flights with uh, helicopters outdoors where you you we harness you in, and it's a way to become an Instagram god. We fly through the canyons of the city. Do you have a really long selfie stick that's uh, yeah, well, weatherproof? The, well, it, the big actually, the, we don't allow selfie sticks, but we have allow professional cameras on 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 lanyards as well as iPhones. But you know the big picture. We used to say a helfie is a helicopter selfie. Now we have a shelfie, which is taking pictures of your shoes hanging off the helicopter,、uh, and that's a big product. You know, proving that people are still craving experiences. So it's really interesting to watch the growth of the company. So, like you said, 1950s flying was very glamorous, and only a few people could do it because it was also very expensive. And today, you get on an American Airlines plane, and I mean, I'm still amazed that this thing, this thing can get off the ground and stay in the air, but it doesn't have that same glamour. Um, helicopters never really、uh, had that, right? It was always a tool for the extremely wealthy to get around. But other than that, it, it was wasn't a corporate very product. Yeah. yeah, it was a really much a corporate. Product. So, would you say you're democratizing helicopter travel? Well, but, you know, I I would say anything that allows you know more people to use it at a lower price, you call it democratization. You know, we're also in seaplanes and other turbo props. So, I kind of like I. We're known for helicopters, but it goes it goes beyond that, and I think it just you know what interests me is again this layer, this emotional connection with the flyer, making the brand stay say mean something. When I hear people say you know I belated to the airport, I belated to Nantucket, and that's really exciting to me. Because usually,、um, you know, when you're flying, even if you charter an air, you know, say you went out and chartered an aircraft, you know, your buddies know you're chartering an aircraft. You probably say, well, who, who did you charter it through? Unless he was interested in chartering, but it wasn't like because of the experience. Yep.、Uh, if I, I know you came, I know you came here by plane, you know, from LA. I'm not really interested whether you flew American or who, when you're not. You want to know what seat I sat in and no, the peanuts、really. or the chips? I probably don't have any anecdotes or anything, but <laughs> the、uh, no. But I actually I have a lot more respect for the large airlines than I ever did because I mean, when you look at the, I mean, I, I, we moved last summer. I don't know, probably about forty thousand people or something in a, in a 16 week period for a 22 person company. It's a lot of people.、Wow. Um, You're only 22 people. 22 full time, and then we have some part, a lot of part time people too. But in terms of like full time employees, 22. Okay.、Um, when I, you know, when I think about the hundreds of thousands of people going to the millions that these people fly, I mean, I think it's a miracle. It's as good as it is. Yeah. So I really、um, have a lot more respect for what they do now than before. Do I think they there are things that they could do better? Sure. Anything. But you know, I think I, you know, one of the things I see the opportunity for us is really, you know. This this special sauce that we come up with to make it exciting. That's what I'm interested in. You said, as a field lead entertainment, you know, I, we produce 14 TV commercials so far. It's a big, you know,、uh, local TV has been really good to us. We use great music. How much do you think your experience has helped you make the brand glamorous?、Uh, I think it's the whole thing. I mean, my, my view is when you walk down to lounges, they know it has to. Our team knows it has to look like a movie set. You've got to be. Brought into another world, you're going to be made to feel special.、Mm. It's all about the details.、It's, you know, it's very similar to, you know, someone making a movie,、uh, or someone who's, you know, completely detail oriented or OCD making an amazing track. Yep.、Um, and、uh, you know, it's a ne- we're creating an art. Makes sense. So Ivanka Trump said to you as as、uh, an amazing business story in her book, as an example of perseverance. Um, I'm curious how you guys met, and if you could briefly tell the story of that first construction loan, because I think it's a really interesting story. Oh,、uh, well, when I was in my early 20s, I、um, uh, I decided I was going to build a house in a town Long Island called Sagaponic, and、um, it was the early 90s, and、uh, loans were the real estate market wasn't great and wasn't easy to get a loan, so.、Uh, Basically, I kind of bundled together credit cards and cash to get enough money to purchase a piece of land,、uh, but that's it. And then what I did is I applied for a special construction loan that rolled into a mortgage, so that would essentially be all the capital that I would I would need. And、um, I applied for the loan. I was told on the phone I'd have it, not a problem. I hired builders, and I got a call from builders、uh, when they're actually with the foundation. They said we're not working until we get your commitment letter. And I'd realized that I had not gotten a formal commitment letter, and I called up then was、um, Bank of New York, and、um, I、uh, 
kept calling them and they said, don't worry, we're working on it. Be, to, be tonight, be tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. And then finally, I'm like, guys, I need this letter right now. And they said, stand by the fax machine. There were fax machines back then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and nothing came. And at the time, uh, it was pre-9-11. It was, security wasn't very uh, um, difficult. You know, I wrote a letter to the C- then chairman and CEO. Um, and it was a pretty nasty letter. And then I tore it up and started again. And I kind of said, I'm in the service business. You're in the service business. Here's what happened to me. I walked over to their, their headquarters. And I looked really young at the time and went up the elevator, asked for the CEO's office. They pointed it to me. Uh, I looked for his secretary. wasn't there. And I saw his office door was open. So I took my letter, went in his office, and put it on his chair. And I left. And I got a call that day uh, that the... CEO had appointed the CFO to be my loan officer, and I was getting the loan. Oh, that's and which great. Which was, was fantastic, but was even more fantastic was I didn't send that original letter, and um, that CEO was Dick Parsons, and I was a media investment banker, and he eventually left to become CEO of Time Warner, and I ended up, he ended up becoming a client. And wow. every time I see, see him, he still says, did you ever pay that loan back? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, so yeah, that was the story an amazing story um how did it wind up in ivanka's book how did you guys meet um we met through her now husband jared kushner mm-hmm. uh and uh she kind of liked the story and was writing a book and asked if she could include it and i said sure yeah what a great story well thank you so much for your time anytime it's been great great meeting you yeah did you like what you just saw you want to see more Go ahead and subscribe. We have new episodes every Tuesday. And if there's someone you want to see on the show, just add them as a comment down below. We'll take a look and we'll have them on if we can. Thanks again.